Corinthians and chapter 3. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank You, Lord. We thank You for bringing us together here. We thank You for the for the impending warmer weather. Father, I know we can, we're can. we all we're all about ready for it. We thank You, Father, for the, for the change of seasons, Lord. And Father, we pray that uh, that as we move through the through the seasons of this life, Father, that we would lay hold on eternal life, that we would be thoughtful of things to come, of all the things that that you are preparing us for today. And Father, that it would be in our hearts to be in line with that, to apprehend, to move in that direction that you are moving us. And Father, we, uh, we do that by our fellowship together, by the study of your word, by prayer, by your Holy Spirit indwelling us, teaching and guiding us. And we pray, Father, that, that you would do that work in us mightily this morning and as we go out as your ambassadors. We pray it all in the name of our precious Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. First Corinthians and chapter 3. Let's begin reading in verse 10. And we'll read down a few verses. 1 Corinthians 3.10 Paul writes, According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. All right, let's stop there for now. We uh, we began kind of into this passage beginning in verse 8 last time where Paul brings in the issue there in verse 8 of reward according to our own labor. And again in 1 Corinthians 3, 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So Paul, we talked last week about that the issue that these Corinthians are having and, and Paul's answer to it uh, is to is to try and, and bring these people together as one, to see themselves as one body, as one unit. And in doing that, Paul brings out the responsibility of each individual member of that of that body to to work for the good of the whole. And and he brings out those two aspects of being a saint, the the uh, collective that is really what he's trying to get across here to counter these divisions that the Corinthians are are uh, are fostering and and encouraging and uh, that they are uh, that that they're having in their church and. So he's trying to get them to see the oneness, and by doing that, he's trying to get each individual to see their responsibility in that, in creating and maintaining that unity. And it's in that context that he brings up this issue of reward according to each man's own labor. And he says again in verse 10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. 
So we are in this passage now coming down into this discussion Paul is about to have on the judgment seat of Christ. And that's what he's talking about here. He uses the illustration of a building. And he says that the grace of God was given to him to lay a foundation. And from that point forward, every one of these Corinthian believers and every believer after that, every member of the body of Christ is now a builder in this, uh, in this endeavor, in this building that God is putting together, the foundation for which he laid by and through the Apostle Paul. So Paul says, I've laid the foundation. You guys are building on that foundation. But <clears throat> let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Now come with me to Second Timothy. We touched on this last week a little bit. Second Timothy chapter 4. There it is, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Sorry about that. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul says, everyone is building on this foundation. The question is, how are you building? And each one of us is to take heed as to how we're building. The things that we do in this Christian life, in our assembly here, in our own lives, those things, the things that we do are not inconsequential. We don't do things without, without taking heed, understanding the consequences, understanding what we're involved in. When we build up, we've talked about this house. This house consists of the body of Christ. It, it goes beyond that in terms of the whole household of God. And all the saved people of all the ages, Paul says, you all are a part of that too. And it has to do with a local assembly, and that is a building of God. And that's what Paul's talking about in our passage primarily. <clears throat> and it has to do with each and every one of us individually. We're all building that house, that edifice uh, within ourselves. So Paul says here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse, starting verse 13, he tells Timothy, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. And that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3 that we need to take heed. How we're building. Here he tells Timothy, in the same context, don't neglect the gift. Use what God has given you. He says, take heed <clears throat> to two things. Take heed to thyself and take heed to the doctrine. So the issue is your life, my life, and what we believe. And those two things are connected and we've been seeing that in 1 Corinthians. That bad doctrine will end up <clears throat> corrupting your life and a bad life will end up moving you into bad doctrine. So those two things both go together. And Paul says, <clears throat> if you want to save yourself and them that hear you, Timothy, you need to take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. So those two things are involved in the in the judgment seat of Christ, when Paul says, back in our passage, let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So, 
We're builders. We're building something into this household of God. Each and every one of us. What you don't want to do is to get the idea that your place in the body of Christ, whatever it is, is inconsequential. It is not inconsequential. No matter what role you play, no matter what service you may do or not, no matter where you stand in the body of Christ, if you're in the body of Christ, you're a builder in this building. Let everyone take heed. How are you building? You are not inconsequential. And I'm not saying that. I'm saying that to encourage you, but not just to encourage you. I'm saying it to warn you. You can't you can't be in the shadows as a member of the body of Christ. God won't allow it. Each one of us is putting something into this body. So the question is, what am I putting in? You need to take heed to that. Think about that. And do it consciously. Be a builder. You are one. So be conscious of that. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is about to go in to this day that he talks about in verse 13. Uh, as always, excuse my voice this morning. We'll get, we'll get through it. And that day is the judgment seat of Christ, the day of judgment for the body of Christ. So he starts this out by saying, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So we're not talking about unsaved people here. We're talking about what each and every one of us is building on this foundation. The foundation of Jesus Christ that Paul laid. In other words, these are saved people we're talking about here. Now, <clears throat> there is a judgment for unsaved people. We know that. We understand that. That's not what Paul is dealing with here. And you don't want to get confused between the judgment for the unsaved, where God sends people off into eternal punishment, and the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ that Paul is talking about here is for saved people. is for people who have the, the foundation. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid. Now, now look, there's all kind of other foundations that people build on. Paul says what we're talking about here, there is no other foundation. We're talking about saved people. The Lord Jesus Christ as he is laid down by the Apostle Paul. So, <clears throat> if you're a saved person, any saved person, you got saved by Paul's Gospel. Now that's important to understand. Now whether you, that person understands it or not, somebody could have been introduced to Christ by John 3.16, that's a verse that a lot of people, a lot of people get saved on John 3.16. But you know how they get saved by John 3.16? By having it explained to them in the light of Paul's Gospel. They don't get saved in John 3.16 in the context of John 3.16. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Well, who did He give His Son to? He gave Him to the whole world. No. God loved the world, He gave His Son to Israel because He loved the world. When did He give His Son to Israel? Not at the cross. Even it's talking about the incarnation. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. See, but if you got saved off of that verse, you didn't that's not that wasn't your understanding. Your understanding was God gave His Son at the cross. That's Paul's gospel. So if you're saved, you're saved on this foundation. The foundation that is Jesus Christ that Paul laid down. Now, 
The reason that's important is because what Paul's talking about here, this this judgment seat of Christ, it, it involves our life, take heed to thyself, and it involves our doctrine, take heed to the doctrine. But in both those things, to live your life and to teach and to believe and to communicate according to Pauline truth is a, is a major factor in this issue of the judgment seat of Christ. Here, come over to Galatians. Chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Someone gets saved and they figure all I need to do now is just go out and love everybody. Be, you know, gentle and meek and all of that. Well, that's all good. It's all Pauline. But not to understand Pauline truth is going to affect people at the judgment seat of Christ in ways that they don't understand. See, when we try to communicate Pauline truth to the saints, it's not just to get them to see things our way. We want to be able to rejoice with them in that day together and we will but the measure and the extent to which we'll be able to do that with all of our brothers and sisters is going to be to the measure and to the extent that they lived by and understood Pauline truth now again if someone is saved they understand Pauline truth so, you got the foundation. Now, how are we building on that? Galatians chapter 2. Paul is yelling at Peter here, or recounting his yelling at Peter. Uh, and he says in verse 15 to Peter, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid! So what are you talking about, Paul? What is this sin that that you're referring to here? Verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. So we're talking about what are we building? What are we building into this body of Christ? Paul says, I've destroyed some things. Now what he's talking about there, come over just a page or two to Ephesians in chapter 2. Peter is eaten with the Gentiles until some came from James. And all of a sudden, Peter got nervous and he separated himself from the Gentiles according to the law. And that's what Paul's on him about. And he says, you're sinning. How is he sinning? Because you're trying to build again what I've destroyed. Ephesians chapter 2. What did Paul destroy? Well, what foundation did Paul lay? The foundation is Jesus Christ. The question is, what did Christ destroy that Paul brought out and taught? Ephesians chapter 2 Verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, those are those guys Peter was eaten with to start with, 
who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now... In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So when Paul says, Peter, you're building again that which I destroyed, this is what he's talking about. Jesus Christ abolished that middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. He abolished the law. So when Paul says, take heed how you're building, Paul says, I can build one way. I can build again that which I destroyed, that is, that which Christ destroyed and told me about and I told you about. But if I do that, I'm making myself a transgressor and I'm making Christ the minister of sin. So let every man take heed. Look, understanding Pauline truth is not inconsequential. Understanding the difference between law and grace People are out there sincerely, diligently building again that which Paul destroyed Amen. and making themselves transgressors. Amen. And that is not going to go over well at the judgment seat of Christ Amen. because we're supposed to take heed how we build. Amen. We're all builders. The question is, how are we building? Back in our passage. 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 12. So we've got the foundation. You can't lay any other foundation. We're not talking about any other foundation here. The foundation we're talking about is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So now we're, we're continuing on with this illustration of being builders. So now Paul, <clears throat> he starts, he, he gives us a list in verse 12 of some building materials that, that we can use to, uh, that is, that it's possible to use to build into this, into this building, into this body. And he says, he gives us Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Now, clearly, obviously, the, uh, the illustration there has to do with things of different value. On the one hand, to start off with, gold is more valuable than silver, and precious stones, and then wood, and hay, and stubble is the is the chaff, the, the dust that's left after you rake up the hay. And uh, and each one of those things is in is has a particular value. So that's what we're talking about. What is the value of what I'm building into the body of Christ, into this assembly, into my own life, into your own life, into this assembly, into the into the body of Christ. What's the value of it? Now we talked last week about this issue of rewards and the, the, the matter of value. Paul talks about righteousness, the righteousness of your salvation as being a reward in Romans chapter 4. But if you receive that, if you're looking to get that reward as a matter of debt, Paul says you, you, you've missed it. You need to see the reward as a matter of grace. Right? And we said that that reward of righteousness is not a reward for your labor. 
It's God's response to your faith. And the value of your faith. Your faith only has value as far as God places on it. Your faith and my faith has no intrinsic inherent value. It's not worth anything except maybe give me a little, you know, peace of mind. It's not worth anything to God except as far as He says it does. God is the one who ascribes value. So, if I'm going to be building something of value in my life, in the body of Christ, where are you going to go to determine what is of value? What kind of value are we talking about here? Is it, you know, there's a lot of things that people value as far as trying to build up the body of Christ. The biggest one seems to be how high can I count the numbers in the in the seats here? How big an auditorium can we can we fill? How many people can we can we get to come in and, and sit and listen? That seems to seems to hold a pretty high value in the eyes of the world. Now look, it's God's will that all men be saved. God the Lord would like to see an auditorium here that fits all men and then and see all men in it. But the, the question is, is that in and of itself something that God values? You go through your Bible. The Lord said there are many, many that are called. Few are chosen. And there's a wide road that many follow. And that road leads to destruction. And the road that leads to life is narrow. And few there be that find it. And it is always the remnant, the remnant that God values. So the question is not how high can we count? That's not the gold and the silver and the precious stones. How many notches can I put in my Bible? The question is, what's the, what's the quality of, the, of, of your workmanship? Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Here, come with me to 2 Timothy. Paul, Paul doesn't use those terms often. 2 Timothy chapter 2. He uses some of them here and gives us an idea of the kind of thing he's talking about. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. People look at those things and they go, well, gold, that's, uh, that's divine. That's the divine metal. Gold means God. And then Silver, that has to do with redemption. And, and then they try and figure out, what, is, what does all of that mean? I think what Paul is, is, is doing there is just that. He's giving us the, the idea and the truth that there is this good and acceptable and perfect will of God that he talks about in Romans chapter 12. That there is such a thing as, as good better and best all being good some being better there is such a thing as approving the things that are excellent knowing the things that are good and approving the things that are excellent see what Paul is trying to get us to do to see to these Corinthians to see is that we are shooting for for first place Every one of us. We're not looking for the bronze. And we're not looking for the silver. There is a difference. Even among all of us as we, as we do well, there is such a thing as doing better. That's why Paul tells the Philippians, I have not yet attained. The Apostle Paul knew that he was still pressing. And we never want to get the idea that you know, all right. I'm you know I'm going to fare pretty well at the judgment seat of Christ. 
Pretty well is not our goal. We're going for the gold. Each and every one of us. So run that you may obtain. And that's the idea there. Second Timothy chapter 2. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2, let's get the passage that we're here for, and then I want to kind of widen that out for us so we can get a good understanding of this. Paul here again talks about that foundation in verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. So there's that. The issue is saved people now. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. So now you get the idea. Between vessels, now these are not, it's in our passage there, now Paul is, is putting a twist on this, uh, on this illustration here in this passage. In 1 Corinthians 3, that, that gold and silver and precious stones is building material. It's going into the building the structure of the house. Here the gold, silver, and the wood and the earth are vessels inside the house. Right? So he puts a little a little twist because the issue now here is our usability. How usable am I for God? How available are you? And how primed are you for God's use? That's the issue here. What kind of vessel do you want to be? In a great house, that's that house of God, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. Now see, what you want to notice here is that now Paul mentions four things, but they're really two categories. Gold and silver is together in one category, and wood and earth is is another category. And the difference between the two is that one's unto honor, one's a vessel unto honor, and one is a vessel unto dishonor. Now these are all saved people. These are members of the body of Christ here. You say, how can I be a member of the body of Christ and be a vessel unto dishonor? Well, you know that wood and earth? Hasn't Paul been telling these Corinthians that you're walking like that natural man? And I couldn't speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. And that we, we looked at that natural man, that that natural man is of the earth. Earthy. Paul he himself, when he's talking about his own physical body he, and the ministry that God has given him, he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. <coughs> so that natural body, that natural man, is that, is that earthen vessel. And a member of the body of Christ, like these Corinthians, who Paul has to say, I couldn't deal with you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. They're being vessels of dishonor. They're being vessels of of wood and of earth. Now look, vessels of wood and of earth have uses in that that great house. Of course, they don't generally get a place of honor like the gold and the silver vessels do. They have a more, you know, you you make a chamber pot out of ceramic, right? See, now that's seriously, that's a vessel unto dishonor. Doesn't mean it's nothing, doesn't mean it's useless. It just means that its use is less honorable than the, than the chalice uh, on, the, on the shelf. See, that's what Paul's trying to get across here. In a great house, again in verse 20, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth. Some to honor and some to dishonor. Just because we're all members of the body of Christ. Paul says, not only gold and silver. You got the other too. You don't want to be the other. If a man therefore, verse 21, purge himself from these. Now the these that we're that he's talking about. We'll get that in a minute when we kind of widen out this context a little bit. 
But what he's talking about is bad doctrine, essentially. We'll look at the verse in a second. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about our works. Every man's work will be made manifest. We're talking about our labor, our good works. And Paul says that if you'll purge yourself from verse 16, look there, what are we purging ourselves from? Verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. And then he goes into this issue of being a vessel of honor, meet for the master's use. You purge yourself from those profane and vain babblings and that bad doctrine, and you'll be a vessel unto honor sanctified in meat for the master's use. So that's the context that we're in here. Now, let's widen that out a little bit because you want to see this. We just read verse 16. Does anybody know verse 15? We all know verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's our context here. As to being a vessel unto honor and unto dishonor, we're all part of the great house. Now, look, that, that, that issue of doctrine plays a big role, but remember, take heed to thyself and to the doctrine. So it is not the only thing. There's all kind of people who have good doctrine and fall short on the other, on the other side. So you, you, you want to have, you want to have both those things. Remember, our mark is the Lord Jesus Christ. He had it all. He had the life and he had the truth. He is the life and he is the truth. That's the mark we're shooting for. So Paul uses those, those terms again and he, and, and you get the idea of the difference between, in our passage, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Those are really not six things. They're two things. They're things unto honor and they're things unto dishonor. And that's really what we're, what we're talking about. Now, back in our passage, another distinction to be made there between those things that Paul lays out, he's going to go on and talk about in the context. And that is the question, what abides the fire? It's not just a matter of what's more or less valuable. Those two categories of things, gold, silver, precious stones, those things, you put those things in fire and they'll come out the other side. As a matter of fact, gold and silver come out even purer than it went in. But it'll come out the other side. What happens when you put wood and hay and stubble in a fire? It doesn't come out the other side gets burned up, gone. And there again, there is there are levels. Because wood takes longer to burn than hay, but it'll burn. And stubble, stubble, that's what you call a flash tinder. Throw that in there, it goes, gone. Blink of an eye. And the twinkling of an eye. So, there is, there is level of value there in the things of dishonor. And that's what Paul's about to go into is that issue of, of the fire. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So all of our work... All of our building is going to be uh, is is going to be made manifest. Every man's work shall be made manifest. So, everything that you do, Paul tells Timothy, 
Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment. Some men, they follow after. Some are a little better at hiding it. Even so, the good works of some are open beforehand. Everybody can see. And some, they follow after. But it'll all come out at the judgment seat of Christ. That's an encouragement and it's a warning to all of us, right? Because you do things and you think they go unnoticed. You walk in your integrity. You know, and integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. So nobody's looking, nobody notices. No, the Lord notices. And it will be made manifest. It will come out at, in this day. And then there are other things that we do that we think nobody sees. That's going to come out too. The things we do under, under cover of darkness. It's all going to be made manifest. Every man's work will be made manifest. Whether it was gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. It's all coming out. So, don't be discouraged thinking that your work is inconsequential because it's not. And don't get the idea that you're getting away with anything because you're not. Neither am I. We're all going to be... You see what Paul calls it there? The day. He's talking about the day of Christ. But that he doesn't say the day of Christ. He just says the day. Because that's the issue here. Is bringing, bringing those things out to the light. Shining the light on each and every one of our lives. Our service. How we built. What we built with. So it's no wonder that Paul says, Take heed. Don't do things thoughtlessly. Do things always understanding that we are going to stand before the Lord. That judgment seat of Christ ought to be before our eyes always. Always. Because what, what are we here for but to please the Lord Jesus Christ? But to hear Him say in that day, well done, or however He's going to say that to us. That's what we're here for. Paul says, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. That's what we're doing here. Is to be accepted. To have our labor accepted of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, now, that fire, we've got a couple minutes here. The gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, that's figurative language. It's not literal. We're not working with literal gold and literal silver. We're talking about spiritual gold and silver and those kinds of things. The fire here, what would that be? Is all our, is, is is the Lord just going to take all of our works and put them in a bag and and put them through a through a furnace? Come back over just just back over to Romans chapter two. Romans chapter 2 talks about the judgment of God. But it's not this judgment seat of Christ. It's talking more, more generally. But it gives us an idea of what the criteria is going to be, what that fire is going to be. Jeremiah says that the word of God is like a fire. Right? And that's what we're talking about here. What's the, what's the criteria by which all of our works are going to be judged? It's God's Word. It's the truth of God's Word. Our works are going to be judged according to truth. That's everything from our motives, the secret thoughts and intents of our heart, to the words that we say, to the works that we, that we perform. All of it is going to be judged, put through that fire of the Word of God. Romans chapter 2, verse 12. We're talking about saved and unsaved people in this, in this passage here. And for as many as have sinned without law, 
shall also perish without law, and as that many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So now we're talking about the judgment of God, and, and in this verse, lost people in particular. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So people judge one another, and that's what Paul's dealing with at Corinth there too. And they do it according to the thoughts of their own heart, accusing or else excusing. But God's going to judge those people, verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So the judgment is going to be according to Paul's gospel. Now, it's also in this passage, because we've already talked about the dispensational aspect, my point to you here is that that fire is the word of God. Look again in verse 12. As many as have sinned without law shall uh, perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So they're going to be judged by the law, and they're going to be judged according to Paul's gospel. Either way, the word of God is that fire that they're going to be exposed to and the word of God is the fire that our works are going to be exposed to now you notice in our passage we got to quit you and I don't go through the fire okay our works go through the fire in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 our we are not being judged and there is a difference. You and I were judged at Calvary. Okay? The fire came down on us there. This is our service. This is our service. See, this is the difference between Paul saying that God has made us accepted in the Beloved. That's you and me in Christ, immovable, unchangeable. We are accepted in the Beloved. And yet, Paul also says that we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. That's our labor. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. So you are accepted, and we want our labor to be accepted. So this is what we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 3. We're not talking about your judgment. We're talking about your works, your life, the things that you've done. Your sins are a non-issue here. Your sins were judged at the cross. Now, that wood, hay, and stubble, is that sin? Probably. But the issue is that the penalty of that sin is already taken care of. The question now is, what did that thing that you did, what did that do to or for this building that you are a part of? Did it tear it down? Or did it build it up? See, that's the question. The question here is not, did you sin against God or did you not? We've already established that at the cross. The issue here is what is your labor doing? What effect is it having on this building of God? That's why I told you at the beginning, we're all builders. Don't think you're not. I don't do anything in the church. I don't do anything as a Christian. I'm just saved. I just live my life. Well, you're a builder. And that's what you're building. And that's what's going to come out. You got no choice whether to be a builder or not. If you're saved, praise God, you are one. So use it. Use it to his glory. So every man's work is going to be tried. It's going to be revealed. The day is going to declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So let me just 
say one last thing about that. You notice the work. What's the criteria? What sort it is? People read that and they think to themselves, God's going to judge every man's work of how much it is. That's not what he says. He doesn't say how much it is. He says of what sort it is. You know how much wood, hay, and stubble you would have to have to truck in to equal the value of one little gold balloon? It's not about how much. There are people with great works that are going to be burned up. It's not about volume. It's about quality. Of what sort? Is it gold, silver, and precious stones? Or is it wood, hay, and stubble? We will pick up in this passage because Paul's not done yet with this issue and, and neither are we. But we got to quit for right now. Do you have a question? Comment? Any further word? No. Yes, Brady. I think about when you talk about the gold and silver, I think about the, uh, the wall of the titian and the olive covenant in the terror blames. Even though they formed it with the wood, but the gold and the silver was what you see. Yeah. But underneath, representing you, is the wood and the stubble. Mm-hmm. The sin was forgiven, but all the wood and the stubble that you didn't put to help build this thing about it, you don't, you don't know about it. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it's well, and and that ark and those uh, pieces of furniture are often used for that, and it's good illustration. That thing was made out of out of wood and overlaid with gold. So it's uh, it's that earthen, it's an earthen vessel, but it it shines and reflects and it the, shows the glory of God, and that's and that's the idea there. Yeah, yeah. All right, thanks, y'all.